we, um, we've been working our way through our hero series. Those of you who've been with us for the last few weeks will know that. And we're basically looking at heroes of the faith. Um, some great heroes, some not so great heroes, some flawed heroes there in both the Old Testament and we'll be working our way through into the New Testament over the coming weeks as we explore this series. Last week we came into the book of Judges and Harold preached on Gideon and this week we're still in the book of Judges and today we're going to be looking at Samson, okay? Now, Many of you will know who Samson is. Samson was famous for having great hair and great strength. But um, I want to look at a little bit more about Samson this morning, okay, as we explore this story. And it's in Judges 13 to Judges 16. And today I want to look at, first of all, um, in terms of where we're going, first of all, I want to look at the context of this story. And I want us to come to realize that the context of this story and this narrative is not so different, first of all, from the context that we actually live in today as the church, as the people of God. I want us to look at Samson. I want us to look at Samson, the anointed man of God. He was the anointed chosen man of God. But also I want us to look at Samson, the flawed man or the man of flaws, the man of vulnerabilities. And I want us to ask the question, who's the real hero in this story. Who is the real hero of this story? To give you some context, the people of Israel, the children of God, had been in slavery for 400 years in Egypt, okay? And God had delivered them from slavery under the leadership of Moses, and he had taken them out into the wilderness where they wandered for 40 years, And then under the leadership of Joshua, they entered into the promised land, okay? They entered into the land that had been promised to them by God, promised to Abraham, promised to him that his ancestors would inherit this land. And when they enter the land, God tells them to clear out the land. The land of Canaan, the land of the Canaanites, was full of um, pagan peoples, full of idol worshippers. And God says, clear out the land, He wanted them to inherit it totally for themselves. This wasn't a cultural thing. It wasn't because God hated those cultures, but it was a spiritual thing. Because these peoples who inhabited the land, they were idol worshippers, they were pagan peoples, and God was giving this land to these people as an inheritance, to the children of Israel as an inheritance. And they were to reclaim it from these idolatrous nations for the worship of one God and one God alone. And so he said, clear out the land and totally inherit it for yourself. We come to Judges 2, Judges 2, verse 1 to 5, okay? And it says this, The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people in this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I have also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. We come then to Judges 3, verse 5 to 6. It says, the Israelites, we find, lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons. And we see, sadly, that they served their gods. You see, as a result of their disobedience, as a result of not completely obeying God and clearing out this land, what we find is the people of God end up giving themselves to the gods of these idolatrous nations. They end up living in a pluralistic society. Leslie Newbigin defines a pluralistic society like this, okay? He says, it's a society in which there is no officially approved pattern of belief or conduct. A society or a condition where multiple principles, sources of authority, or systems of belief coexist. This is contrasted with a state of accepted public doctrine, often shaped by Christianity, which would have provided the norm by which all belief and conduct would have been judged. You see, for the people of God in that time, their accepted public doctrine should have come from the law of of God handed down to Moses. Okay? 
However, what they find now is, because they haven't cleared out the land, they are living among idolatrous nations. They're living among idol worshippers. And so they end up adopting their gods, they end up worshipping their gods, they end up adopting different belief systems, different worldviews, and they end up doing, we read, what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And actually, they do some pretty awful things as they begin to worship these false gods and these idols. You see, throughout the, throughout the book of Judges, if you read the book of Judges from beginning to end, it's a good thing to do, it's a really interesting book, we see a cycle take place, okay? And the cycle takes place over and over again, it repeats itself. We read, first of all, the people do what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They're not worshipping God, they're worshipping idols. They turn from God. And so God hands them over to a foreign nation to oppress them, to judge them. The people, after a while, they get sick of this, and so they turn and they cry out to God for salvation. They cry out to God to rescue them. And God raises up a judge. Now, it's not a courtroom judge like you would see, like Judge Judy or something like that, okay? This is, more, this is a leader, more of a tribal leader. And what we find is, in the cycle, while the judge is alive, things go well, because the judge leads them away from their idols, leads them back to God. He def- the judge, he or she, would defeat the nation that's oppressing them. And while the judge is alive, we find that things go well. When the judge dies, the cycle begins again, and it's not too long before we read, the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. They turn back to all the foreign gods that they find around them in society. But when we get to Samson, The cycle is actually different. There's something different about the story of Samson. The main difference is this. We do not read anywhere in that story that the people cried out to God. That's the main difference. You see, the people have become so used to the Philistines. The Philistines weren't really oppressing them in in the same way they'd been oppressed before. And the people just became assimilated. They assimilate into their culture. They become seduced slowly by the culture that's around them. We find that the Israelites end up conforming to the culture in which they live. They conform to the the, um, Philistine culture. And sadly, Israel does not completely reject God, but they're worshipping God and they're worshipping all these other idols that they find on offer in the culture and society into which they had assimilated and conformed. God was not the only God on offer. There were many gods on offer for them. And you see, this is a culture that we live in today. Today in our society, pluralism is, the, is considered basically to be the proper characteristic of modern-day secular society, okay? We have different, a mix of different cultures, different religions, different worldviews, different ideologies. And today as a church, living in a city like Dubai, we are living in a culture very similar to the culture that the people of Israel find themselves in. We worship God, but there are many gods on offer to us all around us, and we are bombarded by idols, we're bombarded by false gods every day that we live in a city like this. The context is very similar. You see, when it comes to idols, the ancient people had gods for everything, didn't they? They had a god for sex, they had a god for national gods, they had a god of war, they had gods of fertility, they had gods of beauty, they had a god for everything. They worship them in temples, they sacrifice to them on altars. And we think today that we are, we're so different. We've advanced, we've come so far. We could never imagine bowing down, especially in, in, in modern day kind of the society we live in, we could never imagine bowing down to an idol made of wood or stone. But Ezekiel 14.3 tells us this, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. You see, our society is no different. We still have the same gods. We don't carve them into wood or stone, but Ezekiel tells us we have set them up in our hearts. We have idols in our hearts that we worship much like the ancients worshipped in days gone by. How many of you know that thousands of people every weekend, this weekend, will flock 
to the various malls that we have available to worship the God of consumerism. Looking to hopefully find something that will give meaning to their lives, to, give, to find something that will make them happy until next weekend when they go back to the temple of the mall and they worship again, they sacrifice again to the God of consumerism, looking for something to satisfy them. Our gyms, our beauty salons, our makeup counters, our plastic surgeons' offices are full of people worshiping the God of beauty, hoping that their looks will bring them some kind of success or make them happy or open up doors for them or would be a means to their salvation. Our office blocks are filled with people sacrificing their time, their families and their children to the God of success, to the God of career, to the God of achievement, hoping that that would give them some kind of security and some kind of salvation in their lives. Our young people in particular, I think, sacrifice even mental health to the God of acceptance, to the God of status, particularly on social media like Instagram and Facebook. The idol of individuality and the idol of free choice is a huge idol worshipped in our culture today. What is an idol? Andrew Delbanco in his, he writes an excellent book on hope called The Real American Dream. He points out that idolatry is simply taking some incomplete, lesser joy of this world, maybe money or achievement or career or family or even ministry, and building your entire life around that lesser joy. It becomes our hope. And this actually is the nature of idolatry. The nature of idolatry is taking a good thing, a good thing like money, a good thing like career, a good thing like beauty, a good thing like family, a good thing like ministry, but making it the one true source of our hope and hopefully our salvation. We take the incomplete joys of this world and he says the incomplete joys of this world will never, ever satisfy the human heart. In reality, only God the one true God can satisfy the human heart. Rebecca Manley Pippert, in her book, Out of the Salt Shaker, she says this, whatever controls us really is our God. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by the people he or she wants to please. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our life. And how true that is. Let me ask you a question this morning. In a society like this, what are your gods? What are our gods? What controls you? Usually what controls you is your god, your idol. What would destroy you if you were to lose it? What is that one thing, if you were to lose it, it would destroy you and send you into hopelessness and despair? What is more important to you than God what can't you live without? And what is it that you think, if I can just achieve this, if I can just have this, or if I can just have this in my life, then I will be satisfied, then I will be happy, then I will have some kind of meaning. It could be money, it could be career. You know, it could be your culture or your traditions. You're so tied up in serving your tradition or your culture, the way things have been done for so long, that you can't actually do what God is calling you to do. It could be your ministry, it could be your gifting or what you feel called to has become more important to you than God. It could even be your own family. And you see, God wants total discipleship from us. He knows that he is the one thing, the one thing only that will satisfy us totally. The way to defeat our idols is to turn from them and turn back to the one true living God who can totally satisfy the human heart. And that's what these judges were raised to do, and that's what Samson comes into the picture to do, to divorce his people from their idols and turn them back to the one and true living God. Judges 13, 1 to 5, Samson enters the scene, okay? Again, the Israelites, we read, did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zohar named Manoah 
from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor, because the boy is to be a Nazarite. Dedicated to God from the womb, he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hand of the Philistines. The birth of Samson really reminds us of of the birth of Jesus, doesn't it? Angel of the Lord coming to a woman and saying, you're going to give birth to a son, and your son is going to free, is going to redeem, and is going to set his people free. But we find that Samson is a flawed savior in many ways, but he points to the perfect, ultimate savior, Jesus Christ, who would one day come to set his people free. Samson, firstly, is a man of anointing. He is God's called man, okay? He was set apart from the womb. He was set apart as a Nazarite. He was anointed. He was empowered by the spirit, and he was empowered and anointed to actually stir up trouble between the people of Israel and the Philistines, to divorce them from this culture and to separate them from this culture. And we read of Samson doing some incredible feats under the anointing of the spirit of God. Just to name a few, Judges 14.5, a lot of you would have heard of these. First of all, Judges 14.5, the spirit comes on him and he kills a lion with his bare hands. Hands up if you've done that. No matter how anointed you are, I'm sure you've never killed a lion with your bare hands. He does. Judges 14.19, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him and he takes out 30 men. He strips some of their clothes in order to repay a debt that he owed from a bet that he'd got into. He takes out 30 men himself. Judges 15, 14, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He breaks loose from his ropes and he kills 1,000 men with the jawbone of a donkey. This is the kind of stuff you watch on in Marvel superhero things, right? The kind of thing you read about in comic books. This man was God's anointed man. And aren't we impressed? He's clearly anointed. He's clearly God's man for the hour. And God uses him mightily. Yet how many of you know that you can have the gifts of the Spirit in abundance, but actually possess very little or maybe even none of the fruit of the Spirit in your lives? In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit. He lists them. He says wisdom, knowledge, faith, Miraculous powers like Samson had. Prophecy, tongues. Then in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, he lists the fruit of the Spirit. And he says, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All the things that Samson didn't actually have. You see, we need to understand that no matter how anointed we are, no matter how much capacity we have, no matter how much gifting we have been given, It's no indication and it's no guarantee of the growth of godly character in our lives. It's no indication of the presence or the growth of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, gift of the Spirit, but do not have love, fruit of the Spirit, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have the faith to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. You can have the gifts of the Spirit but lack the fruit of the Spirit, rendering our gifts almost, Paul says, as nothing. Samson had all the gifts of the Spirit in abundance. He was God's anointed man, but he did not possess much of the fruit of the Spirit in his life at all. You see, paying attention to our gifting and our anointing and our capacity more than we do to the fruit of the Spirit and our godly character is a dangerous thing. How often, I think particularly in today's internet age, do we look to so many anointed men and anointed women 
The great preachers, the great evangelists, the incredible worship leaders. And we almost pay absolutely no attention to the fruit of the Spirit in their life or godly character in their life. And how often do we sadly read of the incredible anointed man, particularly men, falling as a result of some character flaw, some vulnerability that was present in their life which nobody knew about, which went undealt with. See, Samson was God's anointed man, no doubt, but Samson was a man of great vulnerability. I think there are four key vulnerabilities, and two of them we'll look at in particular. Anger, pride, lust, and self-reliance. First of all, anger. Samson had an epic temper. Whenever he was around the Philistines, it would flare up, and he would end up killing a lot of people. And interestingly, God uses this for his purposes. But Samson never gets a hold of his anger. It controls him. Samson is proud. He's completely unteachable. Throughout the whole story, we don't see Samson's character change much at all, actually. There's maybe two places where we see a glimpse of it, and at the end of his life, we kind of see it. But Samson was a very unteachable guy. He was full of pride. He was arrogant. Whenever he thought someone had wronged him, his pride flared up. It turned into anger, and the results were pretty disastrous. But there were two vulnerabilities, two big vulnerabilities that would actually be his downfall. The first of them was lust, women, or sexual sin. And actually, this vulnerability isn't just for men, it's for women too. We'll call it lust, okay? We see it in three places in particular. We see that women, the opposite sex, lust, has a real hold upon Samson's life. First is in 14.1. It says, Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a woman, a young Philistine woman. Remember, people of Israel were not meant to marry people from other nations. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. See, lust does that, doesn't it? It actually supersedes our reason, what we know we should be doing. And this is something, I have to have her. I have to have him. That's what lust is like. It's a powerful thing that makes us take what we want rather than seek what we should have, knowing what we shouldn't have. The second time is in 16.1. One day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute and he went to spend the night with her. Not only does he sleep with a prostitute, sees another woman, has to have her, but this is in the main Philistine city. This is a danger zone. By now, the Philistines are looking to kill him. Samson goes into their city. He sleeps with a prostitute. And while he's there with her, he's surrounded by the enemy. You see, lust will take us into compromising situations. When we see someone we've just got to have, when lust controls us, we end up in situations, dangerous situations, compromising situations that we would never allow ourselves to get into in our right minds. But if you're a person who is controlled by lust, you end up in vulnerable situations. And Samson was almost caught by the enemy. He ends up in a dangerous place. The third time is in 16.4. It says, sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so that we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. You see, by now, the Philistines have had enough of Samson. They want to get rid of him. And so when they see him fall in love with Delilah, they go to her and they tempt her and say, we'll pay you a lot of money. You'll be a national hero. If you can find out the secret to his strength, let us know what it is so that we can capture him and kill him. And 16, 6 to 10 says this. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you may be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied tied him up with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, you've made a fool of me. You lied to me. 
Come now, tell me the secret of your strength so that you may be tied. You know, it must have been obvious, even in the first place here, what she was trying to do, right? She was obviously trying to capture him. She was obviously working with the Philistines. They were hidden in the room. She's asking for the secret of his strength. Samson lies. He doesn't give it up. She asks him again and again. She asks him four times. The question is, why is he even still with this woman? When he, when he knows very well what she's trying to do. And then we read in verse 17, finally, after her nagging and nagging and nagging him, I'm sure none of the ladies here nag, nag their men, by the way. This is only something that happened way back in the Bible. But after nagging and nagging and nagging, he finally, he finally gives in. And it says, he told her everything. He says, no razor has ever been used on my head. He said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb, if my head was shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. Samson cannot resist women. It's a huge vulnerability in his life. He finally gives up the secret to his strength. The question is, why? Why not keep lying? Why tell her the secret to his strength? Surely this is the biggest mistake he's ever made. Why would he do it? I think the answer lies in his final and greatest vulnerability. See, Samson failed to see the grace of God in his life and he relied totally on his own strength. He relied on himself and not on God. Judges 16, 19 to 22 says this. He stays with her. After putting him to sleep in her lap, he's just revealed the secret of his strength. He falls asleep in her lap, knowing full well what's probably going to come. She called for someone to shave off the seven braids of head on his hair, uh, seven braids of hair, sorry, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. And she called Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him to Gaza. That statement, I'll go out as before, is hugely revealing in the character and life of Samson. He believed that even though he'd now broken his vow, his head was shaved, he believed that he would still be strong. See, he failed to see that his anointing, his, the blessing in his life, the strength he had, was down to the grace of God on his life. He believed it was actually probably down to himself. And so he expected to still be strong, although he had given up the secret to his strength and had his head shaved. See, the most vulnerable position we can ever allow ourselves to be in is when we rely totally on ourselves, where we think our gifting, our anointing will carry us through. When we cease to become reliant, totally, totally reliant on God. And that is the position that we now find Samson in. In 2013, it was revealed that the software giant Microsoft, you've all heard of Microsoft, had paid a hacker 100,000 US dollars to find holes in its products. Well-known British hacking expert and head of vulnerability research at London-based consulting firm uh, Context Information Security, James Forshaw, was awarded one of Microsoft's biggest bounties after he identified a new exploitation technique in Windows operating systems. Why would Microsoft do that? Why would they ask an outsider to point out their vulnerabilities? Surely, number one, it's embarrassing. And secondly, why couldn't they just do it themselves? Why pay someone a hundred, why pay a hacker a hundred thousand dollars to point out their vulnerabilities for them? There's a few things about vulnerabilities that I think we need to understand. Firstly, we can sometimes, in fact, I think we can often be blind to them. We often don't see our own vulnerabilities. Secondly, too often, I think, we're not all that interested in our vulnerabilities. We don't pay enough attention to our vulnerabilities. We pay more attention to our giftings or our strengths, what we're good at, where our anointing has got us to. The enemy, however, cares about your 
vulnerabilities. The enemy cares about your vulnerabilities. He will learn them and he will wait. And when the time is right, usually when you're enjoying success, when you've become self-reliant, he will exploit our vulnerabilities in order to bring us down. And this is exactly what happened to Samson. The enemy learned his vulnerabilities, exploited his vulnerabilities, brought him down. And we now find Samson, this mighty anointed man of God, with his eyes gouged out, brought low by the enemy because he had not dealt with and not recognized the vulnerabilities in his life. Let me ask you, what are the vulnerabilities in your life today? Are you aware of them? Do you know you have them? Are you prepared to deal with them? Because Like I said, the enemy will use our vulnerabilities if they go undealt with to bring us down at some point. A few things about vulnerabilities and how to deal with them. I think firstly, the way that we can deal with our vulnerabilities is to number one, wake up to the fact that our anointing or our gifting is no indication of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives or godly character in our own lives. Our anointing, our gifting is no indication or no guarantee of the absence of vulnerabilities or flaws in our character. Secondly, we need to be honest with ourselves about our vulnerabilities, that we have them. Thirdly, we need to understand that we have an enemy who is seeking to exploit our vulnerabilities and will use them, particularly at our most successful. And fourthly, I think we need to take the Microsoft approach and ask someone that we trust humbly to point out our vulnerabilities, to be accountable to that person, to help us deal with them. What are your vulnerabilities this morning? Are they like Samson's? Are they anger? Are they lust? Have you got a tendency to be dependent totally on yourself? Is it pornography? Is it gambling? Is it a drivenness in your character? Is it money? Is it fear of man? What are your vulnerabilities this morning? Samson, the anointed man, was brought low and defeated by his vulnerabilities. But I want to look at the real hero in this story. Because actually, Samson is not the real hero in the story. And in fact, most of these stories that we read about these, these big heroes, God is the real hero in all of these stories. Judges 16.23 brings us to the end of Samson's story. And it says, Now the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God has given Samson over into our hands. See, the real battle that was taking place in this whole narrative below the scenes was not the battle between Samson and the Philistines. The real battle was between God, the one true living God, Yahweh, and this false God, this idol, Dagon. See, who were the people going to serve? Were they going to serve Yahweh? Were they going to serve Dagon? Who was stronger? Is it Yahweh? Is it Dagon? Who is the real God that the people should be serving? You see, God was not only interested in freeing Israel from its physical oppression under the Philistines. He was not just interested in that. See, God was interested, and I would say more interested, in freeing them from their spiritual idolatry. And that was a real battle that was taking place. God wanted to free his people from their spiritual idolatry and prove himself to be the one true living God. See, the Philistines were convinced that the idol was responsible for their success and their victory over Yahweh and over Samson. How often do we credit our idols, our false gods, with our success? How often do we think, my intelligence has got me this far? My abilities, my giftings have got me here. My career has given me this security, my financial security. My family are the ones that make me happy. All the time, without realizing that it's God who is behind all of the grace and the mercy in our lives. And we see gathered in this temple, the Philistine leaders, great multitudes, 3,000 people on the roof, and the statue of Dagon himself. Judges 16, 28 tells us this. When Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me with just just once more. And let me 
with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson reached towards the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on one, his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed more when he died than he did when he lives. Samson finally realizes that his strength is down to the grace of God. He calls out to God, God is faithful, and Samson, God topple the idol. The idol of the Philistines is defeated and toppled. You see, God vindicates his name. God will always vindicate his name. We haven't got to defend God. He will always show himself to be the one true living God. He will topple the idols. He will topple our idols and he will show himself to be strong. He will show himself to be God. I think sometimes in our lives we look at our situations and we don't understand what's going on. We think, why is my career going south? Why has that relationship not worked out the way I hoped it would? Why are my gifts not being recognized? Why am I not being released yet as I thought I would? Why am I not married yet? Why do I not have children yet? Why are my dreams not being fulfilled? And sometimes we don't realize that God is toppling our idols. God is defeating the idols, the very things, the gods of this culture around us that have become more important to us than him. You see, God is more interested in defeating our spiritual idolatry than he was in getting rid of the physical oppression of the Philistines. God will topple idols. He will vindicate his name. He will show himself to be the one true living God, the only one worthy of our worship. I want to close with this. God will remove our idols. He will destroy them. He will vindicate his name. It's sometimes we don't understand what God is doing. But that is exactly what he's doing. See, at the end of this story, we get to the close of Samson's story. We see Samson at the cost to his own life, arms stretched out, rejected, beaten, humiliated, alone, bound. We see him triumph over his enemy. We see him deal a deadly blow to the oppression of the Philistines and we see him topple that Philistine idol and that Philistine God. But we know that the people of Israel would keep sinning. They would keep turning back to their idols. They would keep going back to their sin over and over and over again despite Samson's victory. See, this story shows us our sin. It shows us our idolatrous hearts. This story also shows us our need for a savior, but not a savior like Samson. It shows us our need for a perfect savior. And we see later on the cross, Jesus, at cost to his own life, arms stretched out, rejected, beaten, humiliated, bound and alone, triumph over the enemy once and for all, dealing a final blow to the powers behind all oppressors, to the powers behind all of our idols, to the powers behind all of our sin. And we see him defeat Satan, sin, and death, and the powers behind all of our vulnerabilities. You see, our victory over sin, our victory over our idols, our victory over our vulnerabilities, our salvation is found in no other place than Christ and his victory on the cross. Will you stand with me? I want to pray for us. Let's let's stand. We're going to go back into worship in a second. We're going to respond to God and all that he is saying to us. I also want to make sure we give time to respond later on in the meeting as well to anything that God is saying to us this morning. But just close your eyes. If you want to put your hands out, you can. But I want us to come before God. Father, we recognize this morning that you are the one true living God. We recognize that there is no God beside you. There is no God greater than you. Lord, we recognize that we 
We have accepted idols into our hearts. We have built altars to false gods, to idols. We recognize that there are vulnerabilities in our lives. We recognize that there is sin in our lives. But we recognize that the cross was a place where all of that was dealt with. Where all the power behind our idols, the power behind our sin, the power behind our vulnerabilities was defeated. Satan, sin, and death were dealt a final blow by Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. We come before you, Jesus Christ, today. And we say, would you come by your spirit right now? I pray for everyone in this room. I pray that you would settle and rest upon every person in this room right now, Lord. I pray that you would deal with vulnerabilities. I pray that you would tear down idols. I pray that you would be champion over sin and idols and vulnerabilities in our lives right now. We ask as we go back into worship, Father, would you do a great work in us through your spirit. We give you all the glory. Amen. Let's worship him.